The question of women and Islam is absolutely central to all sorts of debates that are taking place um, in British society, and not just in Britain, but also as a global phenomenon. The dominant image that we have is of the submissive woman, the woman who is completely powerless, um, who walks two paces behind her husband's back and has absolutely no rights whatsoever. Um, the assumption within this, of course, is that there is something very specific and quite peculiar to Islam itself, its culture, its civilization, its history, which therefore predisposes that particular culture to treat women in an inferior manner. Um, you only have to think about the statements of people like Laura Bush uh, when we were about to go to war in Iraq, who talked about um, how the brutality against women and children by Al-Qaeda terrorist network and the regime it supports in Afghanistan was a reason for us to go to war. Not to be outdone, of course, Cherie Blair also added that the burqa was one of the crucial barriers um, that Afghan women face. And I think that what's interesting about how these debates are framed is that there is this underlining assumption that not only is there something peculiar which predisposes Islam to be inherently backward towards women, women but also that, by, you know, by correspondingly so, that there is the moral inherent superiority of the West and Western civilization and its culture. And therefore that women, Muslim women, need liberation from Islam if they are to take their full place alongside their sisters inside the Western world. Um, now, you know, there have been lots of meetings throughout this weekend about Islamophobia and fighting racism and what have you. So, I'm sh you know, hopefully I don't have to state here that for us as socialists, we utterly reject the racist stereotypes on which these views are based. However, there, of course, is also a strain of secularism and feminist narratives, which also tend to uh, go along with some of these portrayals about Muslim women. Um, now, what I want to begin with is really saying is that there is a problem here, because most of these ideas are based upon quite a, an ahistorical notion of what Islam is. The, um, the kinds of um, evidence and sources that they use at best are very superficial um, and at worst completely flimsy and what you end up with are very lazy characterizations and stereotypes that exist in the world. Um, and because I am a nerdy historian for my sins, I'm afraid I'm going to visit that discipline upon you for a short while, so please bear with me because I think it is important for us to look at what actually exists and for us to look at the evidence um, and, this, um, and what the evidence is um, actually indicating. Um, now, of course, when you're dealing with any religion, and Islam in one sense is no difference, um, the kinds of sources that we're talking about um, are particularly, of course, uh, the religious texts. Um, and here, of course, we have the Quran, um, but we also, of course, have um, the Hadiths and the Sunnahs, which are somehow seen as being synonymous, but these are essentially um, many of the writings that were composed after Muhammad's death by his companions, um, by his friends, by relatives, who were putting together a corpus of knowledge in terms of what Muhammad preached, uh, what he said, uh, what his example were, etc. And they were trying to compose these together to uh, form the body of Islamic uh, knowledge. Now, of course, there is an inherent problem in here. Firstly, the problem is that many of these were written many centuries after Muhammad died. Um, there's also the problem, of course, about people's memory, about how information and stories are handed down and what have you. So there are all sorts of um, issues um, and weaknesses in some of these primary um, texts. However, that does not mean to say that throughout uh, many centuries and many generations that a whole range of scholars have not been able to use both these sources and others to try to um, trace some kind of narrative about what life was like for Muhammad and also, more importantly, what life was like in early Islam. And I want to begin with early Islam because... You know, one of the, um, you know, the, the narrative that says that somehow women have always been treated inferiorly really doesn't understand anything whatsoever about his, how Islam began. And I want to begin um, by going back to the first women in Islam. Um, and there were many 
women in early Islam. Um, Muhammad himself um, is said to have had a series of wives. Um, there's some debate as to whether or not there were 12 wives or 13 wives. Um, I'm not going to quibble about that. Um, but what is very interesting here is, again, this is taken as evidence that, you know, here we have a patriarchal man that, you know, owns and controls, uh, you know, a dozen wives and women and doesn't allow them any freedom in any shape or form. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the wives. I'd be here all day. Um, but I do want to pick out two of his most significant wives. I want to talk about Khadijah and Aisha. Now, Khadijah was Muhammad's first wife. Um, and... Um, as a woman, she was a wealthy employer. She was a merchant in her own right, a very, very successful businesswoman um, trading in uh, Mecca. Um, her father, Khadijah's father, had been an honored member of um, the main elite tribe in 6th century Arabia, the Quraysh tribe. Her father um, was very successful at the time. He had a particular talent for business and for accumulating vast wealth. In other words, he was a modern-day uh, venture capitalist. And it was said that his daughter, Khadijah, had inherited many of his talents, and she certainly did. She was very well respected as a businesswoman. She was very shrewd. Um, she had her own personal fortune um, and was uh, extremely successful and continued her father's business after his death. Now, Khadijah had also been married twice, um, and widowed. Uh, she was 40 years old when she hired Muhammad to um, trade, uh, to lead her caravan between Mecca and Syria, which was one of the main trade routes at that time. Now, Muhammad was known to Khadijah because he was a distant cousin of hers, so part of her wider uh, kinship clan. But Muhammad was only 25 years old at the time. He himself was also acquiring quite a reputation for being a trustworthy fellow in matters of both business and commerce, but also in dealings um, with family issues and trying to settle quarrels between people. Um, and when Khadija hired him, he did such an excellent job in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, leading her caravan that he more than twice doubled her profit, um, and so she, obviously she was a very, help, a very happy uh, businesswoman. Um, but as a result of this, they got married. Now, she proposed marriage to him. Um, now, you've got to remember, we are talking about um, 7th century Arabia here, and of course, uh, he gladly accepted, um, and therefore they were married. Now, their marriage didn't last very long because she was to die, but it was a monogamous marriage by all accounts, a very happy marriage, um, but it was a monogamous marriage. It was just those two. And it's very, very significant here that she is the one that proposed um, marriage, um, and this was without uh, the need of a male intermediary or a guardian or anything like that. Partly what explains this, I think, is her role as being a successful, wealthy businesswoman, a woman of status, a woman of leading standing throughout Meccan society. Um, you know, sort of, if you accept this notion that, you know, Muhammad had revelations from Gabriel, etc., etc., with the word of God, whatever, whatever it is, you know, sort of, like, what we can perhaps agree upon is that he certainly felt that he was having some kind of voices, some kind of imagery, um, and therefore being destined to, uh, to, 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 lead, to lead a group of people. Certainly he was into contemplation. What's also interesting here is there is a material factor behind all of this because it was precisely Khadijah's wealth that freed Muhammad from the dredge of labor. Um, and that meant that he could sit around in the hills of Mecca, looking up at the skies, contemplating, thinking about the world, um, and of course in thinking about the world, thinking about a lot of rotten things that Meccan society was about, um, and perhaps thinking about what should be done with all of these sorts of things. Now, when it comes to his third wife, Aisha, she was the youngest of his wives um, in puberty when she married him. Um, her marriage was arranged in quite a different manner. Um, she was born in Mecca. She was also the first daughter of a man by the name of Abu Bakr, who was to go on to become the first caliph after, uh, after Muhammad uh, dies. Um, now, um, da, 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 where am I? Yes. 
Aisha was seen as being, she was very, very young, but she was seen as being a woman of intelligence. She was also seen as being very courageous and also being very charming for someone that was so young. She was seen as being the favorite spouse of, uh, of Muhammad. She sometimes accompanied him on his travels. And when he died, she was at his side. So partly as a result of that, she's very much revered within Islam. I mean, so is Khadijah. It's important to point out that, you know, Khadijah is revered by um, the Islamic world uh, precisely because she was seen as being a woman who was very pious, um, but also because she had enormous wealth, she was able to support charitable works as well. And, of course, she was also the first convert to Islam. Aisha is revered for all sorts of other reasons. Um, she was quite educated. She was seen as being an authority on medicine, um, on history, and also a great poet um, in her time. She was also responsible for collecting together um, many and recording, helping to record many of the sayings of Muhammad and getting them recorded into what is referred to as the Hadith um, and reporting them to his companions and what have you. And several scholars have traced more than 1,200 of these Hadiths back to Aisha's authority. So again, a very, very significant figure in her own right in terms of the role that she played in early Islam, particularly in terms of sort of beginning to put together a corpus of knowledge um, about Islam um, and, uh, and how Muslims, Muslims should, should behave. She also played a central low role in leading prayers for both men and women in the early years of the, of the Muslim community. Now again, when you think about these two women, they don't in any shape or form fit the narrow stereotypes and characterizations um, that sadly we, uh, we have, a, we have um, amongst us in the, 21st, uh, in the 21st century about what women are supposed to be like. I just want to mention a third woman, um, and this is Fatima, who of course was Muhammad's daughter. She was the daughter by his first marriage to, um, to Khadijah. Um, she, uh, she also goes on to become the wife of the fourth caliph in Islam, um, Ali. Um, she was also born in Mecca. Um, when she marries Ali, she also has um, ch her children, um, Hussein and uh, Hassan, go on to become um, the, I suppose, the founders of what is referred to, you know, of, of Shia Islam in many ways. Um, and she's very much revered by Muslims um, who trace her because she's a descendant directly of the Prophet, um, and therefore they believe that she is um, completely pure. She's seen as being um, included as a woman um, among the 14 perfect pure ones in terms of Shia Islam. Her name, Fatima, of course, also gave rise to the Fatimid dynasty, which is based around uh, modern Day, modern day Egypt. Um, now, she, she wasn't particularly um, renowned as being necessarily political or involved in being, um, being central to, um, to the development of Islam in many ways. However, um, she did have quite a significant position inside of, uh, inside of, uh, Islamic, uh, inside of uh, Islamic society at the, at the time. Although she wasn't particularly active in uh, political affairs, um, said, said to living a life, quite a quiet life, um, nevertheless, she is very much seen as being a model of a woman, not just in terms of a daughter and a wife, but also in terms of symbolizing um, how a leading woman can be inside of an Islamic, Islamic society. Now, the reason I say all of this is for two reasons. One is obviously to show that it's not the case that women have always been submissive, but also because when we look at particularly Khadija and Aisha, there are differences in terms of their life with Muhammad. Um, the fact that Khadijah proposed marriage, whereas in Aisha's case, it was very much a marriage that was arranged by her relatives to, uh, to Muhammad. Um, what helps us to explain what these differences were? Now, Arabian society, predating um, Islam, was a society that was in a state of flux. The reason for this is partly because it was at the center, or very much on the edges, I should say, of two major empires at the time, the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire in the east. Uh, these two major empires had been at war with each other for many decades and centuries. By the time we get to the 5th and 6th century, the empires are collapsing, uh, both as a result of inter uh, uh, internal divisions, but also as a result of external uh, threats in terms of new ideas and new formations arising. 
The disintegration of these two empires led to a complete questioning of the kinds of values that existed in those societies. These two empires had been dominated by uh, Christianity um, in, on the, on, on, in terms of the Byzantine Empire and by Zoroastrianism, Parsism in, uh, in the East, in the Sassanid wing. Um, there were all sorts of, um, e even though these were... Um, monotheistic religions, there were all sorts of problems inside of these societies, not least of which, of course, was the oppression of various minority groups, including Christian minority groups um, and Jewish groups and what have you. And it's into this state of flux that you really have the backdrop in which Islam begins to arise as a creed, um, as, a, as a political authority. Now, into this flux, Muhammad's teachings were to play quite a significant role because in these societies, there wasn't just one form of family life. There wasn't just one form of marriage relationship. You had, I mean, most of these societies, most historians have said that what tended to dominate were matrilineal societies. Um, now, just because they were matrilineal does not mean to say that they were matriarchal. doesn't mean to say there was an absence of patriarchy within these societies. Uh, but in what matrilineal did mean is that, for example, in many instances, you had, it was the uh, woman's family that were absolutely central inside the family and wider network. Um, after marriage, it, there was the notion that you would live closer to the woman's family and not the man's family. Um, in terms of uh, Muhammad himself, it's actually quite significant because in his own life, um, Sorry, I've just uh, completely lost what I was about to say. Yes, in his own life, um, he had been very much brought up within his uh, mother's, uh, mother's family. Um, he had been with his um, mother's family after his mother Amina died, his father Abdullah. It was quite difficult for him necessarily to get access to Muhammad. He had to visit Muhammad, his son, um, inside his family's home. So women occupied quite a central role. In that kind of scenario, a woman of substance to, uh, I suppose, to give Khadija her real title, because that's what she was, um, it wasn't at all surprising that a woman in that kind of situation, who was quite mature, who'd been experienced, who was widowed, who had enormous standing um, as, a, as a businesswoman in her own right, it was not at all unusual for her to propose marriage to a man who was much younger than her and for it to be completely seen as being acceptable. Now, that does not mean to say that in that same society you did not have other types of practices whereby, of course, you did have uh, men interceding, men going along to other kinship groups, other family groups, and wishing to propose their daughters or somebody, some female member of their clan to somebody else in terms of marriage. That also existed. What I'm trying to say is that there were multifarious different types of practices that existed in Arabia at that time. What is also quite significant here is that by the, by the time we get to Aisha, the third wife, and other wives, what we also notice is that whereas Muhammad had a monogamous relationship with Khadija, what we begin to witness with, uh, with Aisha is that Muhammad is taking on more than one wife. Um, now, what's interesting here, of course, is that in terms of Muhammad's teachings, um, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to go into all of this, but one of the reasons why Islam was able to attract a whole series of followers at the time that it did is partly because a society that was in such a state of flux, because the two major empires that had, allowed, that had given some kind of solidity, that had given some kind of stability, not just economically and politically, but also in terms of um, social values that existed in that society, as it was beginning to crumble, all sorts of old ways of living, all kinds of old value systems were in a state of flux as well. And not only that, but also, of course, there were a whole series of oppressive practices. Part of Muhammad's teachings were about looking at existing society and trying to bring about some kind of order into those societies. So, for example, there were all sorts of practices whereby men were very abusive towards women. Um, you know, so like men would walk away from marriages, they would walk away from their wives, leaving them quite destitute. There were all sorts of horrible, oppressive uh, practices that, that did exist. Part of the teachings of Muhammad were about saying that, no, women had to be treated with respect. 
They couldn't just be used and abused. Even when it came to marriage, this notion that somehow, you know, a man can have up to four wives, well, yes, that was absolutely true. It was part of the teachings of Muhammad. But part of what he said about this was that a man can only take up to four wives if, A, he is able to support all four of them equally, and, B, if he is going to be able to treat them all in an equal manner and provide for all of them, plus any children that come out of this. Now, you know, to me, this is not my idea of any kind of women's liberation in any shape or form. However, in the context of 7th century Arabia, given what life was like for most women, this was seen as being enormous progressive. Similarly on questions of divorce. You know, the pre, uh, pre-Islamic monotheistic religions um, were absolutely taboo on the question of divorce. You know, if anybody thinks that, um, that um, other monotheistic religions like Christianity or Judaism were more favorably disposed towards women, think again. Inside of Islam, Muhammad did stipulate that women could have the right to divorce. He also stipulated that a woman had a right to retain her own property. Now, again, this is not anything which is like, you know, big historic changes for us in our 21st century, but at that particular time, they were seen as being quite significant and and quite... uh, and quite, quite forward-thinking at all, at all sorts of, at all sorts of levels. Um, I also want to say something else here, because when we're talking about what helps to explain the way that um, different women were treated within, uh, within Arabian society, what's also very important to understand is that The kind of world that Islam lived in, as I said, you had these practices of matrilineal societies, but you also had something else that was going on as well. Um, And this is particularly to do with um, the way that women and property were seen within this particular societies. Um, In these societies... The status of women was undergoing a deep, deep transformative, transformative impact. Um, as I said, partly as a result of what was going on in terms of um, in terms of Muhammad's teachings, but also as a result of how the notion of lineage was seen in in much of Arabia at the time. Um, pre-existing um, ways of living didn't really emphasise very much the question of um, patrimony. Um, It wasn't seen as being particularly significant. As these societies were undergoing deep, deep transformation, the whole question of wealth, the whole question of uh, status, meant that the question of patrimony, meant that the question of who your offspring were, begins to take on more and more of a significance. And in these societies, therefore, the importance of marriage, the importance of a woman, Um, Having children with one man was seen as being very significant. Um, And the whole idea of how um, society was going to evolve was also seen as... Ah, right, God almighty, I've got to to speed up here. Okay, sorry, I will begin to speed up. Um, Two other things I want to say is that in the medieval era... um, which is partly seen as being quite a golden era for Islam, its expansion in terms of Andalusia, its expansion um, in terms of uh, the big empires of the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughal Empire. Again, in these societies, you know, medievalism is seen as being quite a barbaric period. That's how we're normally taught about this in history. But I just want to give one example to illustrate something which I think is very important about how societies change. In the Ottoman Empire... Um, They had, it was a very, very um, long empire, but they had a system which is a confessional system, which is the millet system. It meant that the different uh, monotheistic groups, Christians, Islam, and um, Judaism, had their own communities that could basically set their own uh, values. They had the right to set taxes, to collect taxes, and they had enormous power to wield in terms of what kinds of practices existed for their own specific communities. Now, you could argue that this was, uh, this was, uh, this was very good and very, very positive. However, what is also the case is that by the time we get to the... Um, 
By the time we get to the, third, uh, the 15th, sorry, the um, 18th century, the millet system is causing a problem for the Ottoman Empire because these confessional groups start to become the basis of power uh, status. Uh, um, they start to become the base of where they can be roots of opposition to the Ottoman Empire. And what happens in this kind of scenario? Two things happen. One is these confessional groups who are made up of jurists, who are made up of um, Islamic scholars and what have you, over many, many years begin to start stipulating uh, what men can do, what women can do, and what have you. And there are all sorts of restrictions that are placed upon women as a, as a result of this. But also, because this corresponds to these groups also, perhaps beginning to be the basis of opposition to the centrality of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire undergoes a, tra um, a transition. This transition is referred to as the Tanzimat era, which is essentially an era of reforms. The reason that the Ottoman Empire does this is partly as a result of the fact that the Ottoman Empire has been in decline by the time we're in the um, 18th century and the early 19th century, particularly geographically, where it is losing much of its territory to rising European empires. And so one possible way for them to see a solution through this was to try to, wish to have a period of reform. And in this period of reform, a whole series of things were enacted. Uh, paper money was being introduced. Uh, they changed the national flag and introduced a new national anthem and what have you. But also in this period of reform, an opening began to open up for women. Now, these were elite women. We're talking about literate women who were able to start... Um, putting together and articulating a critique of existing Ottoman society about particularly to do with elite women, how they were being um, not, not giving access to some of the uh, to, 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 to some of the great material benefits, to some of the rights that they felt as elite women they should be entitled to. Why? Because the confessional, um, the confessional practices that existed under the millet system meant that it was um, Islamic scholars and jurists that were having the right to do this. Now, simultaneously, under this era of reform, what we witness is a whole series of Islamic scholars and others who say, in this period of opening up, what we need to do is to return to what they said is um, ijihad. Now, ijihad is a concept in Islam which is about free thinking. It was about inquiry, which goes back to early Islam and early medieval Islam. Um, and this was a practice that led to great scholars who said that, yes, we should be able to have free thought in terms of how we interpret, in terms of how we think about how Islam can be applied in the world that we live in. And a whole series of teachers begin to arise in this scenario. Now, what's significant here is that even in the medieval era, when to, in many respects, in different empires, there were all sorts of restrictive practices on women. I mean, you know, these were not particularly pretty enlightened societies. But what we do see, and again, I'll just give one example of this. This is from the Safavid Empire. There were women scholars that rose to become um, leaders of interpreting what specific hadiths, what specific sunnas, or even the Quran had to say in terms of the teachings about the Quran and about Islam. And the point about, for me to, the reason why I'm giving you this example is because in this period of opening up, and the period of opening up corresponds to deep, deep fissures and deep, deep crises and deep, deep turmoil inside these societies. I'm just giving you the example of the Ottoman Empire here. However, once you have these kinds of opening up, by the time we suddenly get to the start of the 20th century, this maneuver for reason, for its jihad, we suddenly begin to see it come under some kind of attack because suddenly there is the question of, well, we can't just have anybody going around interpreting this or interpreting that scripture in this way. We need to have some kind of order here. The reason order suddenly became important again is because, of course, by the time we get to the beginning of the 20th century, particularly for the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire is in deep, deep problems. And obviously... Um, it's crumbling even further. 
Obviously, by the time you get to the First World War, it's completely, completely carved up on what have you. Now, that could not be foreseen at the start of the 20th century, but nevertheless, um, the weakening of it, the weak, not, not only the weakening of the empire, but also what that represented for the elites that governed the empire was quite significant. And therefore, in order to reassert their control, their control was not just about political authority, but the control was also going to be about other aspects of society in terms of wanting to have a period of closure on what previously had been a period of opening. Um, right, I'm going to have to very much speed up. I want to say something about the veil, because of course the veil, more than anything else, is seen as being very symbolic of the backwardness of uh, Islam. Okay, first thing that has to be said about the veil is that it isn't something which is specific to, uh, to Islam. You know, Muhammad did not introduce and invent the veil. The veil predates um, Islam. It was practiced um, by a particular group in society, spe specifically in urban areas, um, and it was particularly practiced by Greeks, by Romans, by Assyrians, and it was something that was very much collect connected to social status. Um, so, for example, in the early 13th century, there is a legal text which restricts the, wear the wearing of the veil amongst um, Assyrian women to just noble women. Okay? And it specifically, as an edict, forbids it to be worn by prostitutes and common women. In classical um, Hellenistic statues, we have a whole series of Greek women um, who have their head and their face covered. Again, these are women of high status. Of course they are, because that's why we have statues of them. You don't particularly see loads of statues being given over to poor women and peasant women. Um, in, um, in ancient Rome, women were expected to wear a veil as a symbol of their husband's standing in society and also as a symbol of their husband's authority uh, within society. If a married woman refused to wear the veil, this was seen as tantamount to her wanting to walk out of the marriage, and this was seen as grounds for divorce. Um, a Roman council um, divorced his wife because she went out unveiled, because as he put it, by going out into the public unveiled, she allowed everybody else to see what only he should be entitled to see. Um, now, of course, you know, these societies were both patrilineal societies, they were also, of course, very patriarchal societies, but the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that the veil, not only does it predate Islam, but more importantly than that, it is something which is particularly associated with the high status of women within that society. It was a signifier of their standing, it was a signifier of the standing of their husband, of their family, for women that were seen as being common, for women who were seen as being prostitutes, it wasn't something that was to be synonymous with them because, of course, they're just riffraff. Who cares whether they're seen, not seen? Of course, in most scenarios, the poor are never seen in any shape or form. They're just there to provide, to provide labor for you. Um, and again, inside the Quran, people want to always use, you know, say that, you know, oh, in the Quran, the, you know, the prophet says that women have to veil themselves, etc., etc. And again, I think it's really, really important to think very carefully about this historically, because the veil is not prescribed inside the Quran. There are some passages, some verses, which deal with women's clothing, but there, what the instruction is, is for women to guard their private parts and to throw a scarf over their bosoms. Now, I don't know about you, but um, you know, I regard what I'm wearing as covering my private parts. Okay? I don't need to have a veil, a headscarf, etc., etc. So the way that this is actually then interpreted within, uh, within Islam is up, is up for debate, debate here. Um, the other thing that's also very significant is that in the time of Muhammad, most women did not practice veiling. Um, what's very significant here is that the practice of veiling is something that comes as a result of the pre-Islamic practices that Islam 
as a tradition, uh, began to interact with once Muhammad and his armies began to be successful in spreading the word of Islam beyond the peninsula of Arabia. And therefore, a whole series of pre-existing practices uh, that existed within the uh, crumbling Byzantine Empire, that existed within the crumbling Sassanid Empire, that existed within the other monotheistic faiths of Christianity and Judaism, as well as a whole series of other polytheistic traditions, where veiling in one form or another was practiced by women of high status began to be incorporated into Islam. When Muhammad dies, it's very, very interesting. The practice of actually um, wearing some kind of headgear is something that was seen as being associated with his wives, not with all Muslim women. And over many, many, many decades and centuries after his death, because women who were married to Muhammad were obviously revered, and also because Meccan society was being transformed, and therefore the status of the elite Quraysh tribe was also being transformed, the practices of status being associated with women wearing a certain type of clothing, of course, was then to be emulated by the elites by the Muslim elites of Arabia and beyond Arabia. And slowly but surely, what you begin to see is the adoption of all types of clothing, which are then seen as being synonymous with Islam in terms of women. But the most important thing to understand here is that it isn't something that begins with Islam. It is not something that was a creature or the creation of Muhammad. It is actually something that predates that. And Islam, like all traditions, begins to adapt in all sorts of forms to a whole variety of practices and customs that, uh, that existed. Okay, last few minutes. Um, I want to say something about um, both secular feminism and Islamic feminism. Because, of course, the narrative of secular feminism is something that we're very familiar with, you know, not just in terms of the lunacies of Laura Bush and Cherie uh, Booth, but of course, particularly amongst activists, um, there are many, many good, really, really good activists that we work with, um, you know, who are influenced by a whole series of feminist ideas, which, you know, which is very, very good, and they want to absolutely, you know, tear and rip women's oppression apart, which we share with them completely. Uh, but they end up thinking that somehow there is something very, very specific about Islam. Um, and, you know, and what I think is really quite problematic about that is that it doesn't really begin either from the evidence, but it also doesn't begin from understanding what the world is about. Because the kinds of racist stereotypes that I said earlier, sadly we have a scenario where in the name of secularism, you, and in the name of feminism, you have people completely uh, buying into a narrative which treats Islam and all Muslims as somehow needing salvation and needing the civilizing mission of the West. And I'm sorry, this is totally and utterly akin to the civilizing mission of the colonial project as it existed in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. All right. This has nothing to do with secularism. It has nothing to do with feminism. It's had absolutely everything to do with racism. And as such, as socialists, we completely and utterly reject that. But what I also want to say is that there has been a rise in um, what's termed as Islamic feminism. Um, and there are a whole series of um, scholars that have written a whole series of books um, which in many respects is quite welcome because what they've been trying to do is to challenge the notion that there is anything peculiar to Islam um, which makes it more oppressive towards women. Um, and so uh, there's one scholar in particular, Fatima Manisi, who says that the emancipation of women is about rereading the past, about reappropriating everything, and she says that the mosque and the Quran belong to women. Um, and in many respects, this antidote to this idea that Islam is just you know, the body of men, etc., is, is quite welcome. In some respects, it's quite a necessary corrective against this assumption that everything in Islam is backward and barbaric. But in trying to reappropriate, in trying to reread everything, what a strand, the strand of Islamic feminism does is that it also accepts that 
there is something within the religion itself that women can appropriate. In other words, in the same way that many secular feminists and outright racists say that there is something very specific and peculiar in the religious text itself which makes Islam more predisposed to be backward and oppressive towards women, Islamic feminists seek to find in these same texts some kind of virtue that shows that um, Islam can be more progressive. Now, I think there's something quite problematic about that method because it sees everything to do with women as being rooted in religion and in texts. Now, as one very, very old white male man said, man, religion was not, sorry, man was not created by religion but religion was created by man. And of course, this was Karl Marx. I mean, you know, I'm not going to uh, go through all sorts of quotations by, of Marx. You know, people will have heard meetings here at Marxism throughout the weekend in terms of a Marxist analysis of religion. But all I want to say is that I think what's very important to understand is that religions do not grow up in a vacuum. No religious tradition, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, you name it, have grown up in a vacuum. They are very, very specific to the kind of society in which they have been rooted in. They are very, very specific. They are very, to a great degree, they are structured in many respects by the kinds of worlds that they have been, that they, have, that they, that they are a creature of. And as such, in any so-called religious tradition, what they are trying to do is to make sense of the kind of world that they have arisen in, make sense of all sorts of problems, make sense of all sorts of practices, and in many respects, try to work out new types of practices and new ways of living. In doing that, religious texts, if that's the phrase people wish to use, um, are completely open to all sorts of interpretation. You know, this process and th um, of ijtihad that I mentioned earlier, of reasoning and thinking, is something that's always happened um, when it comes to different kind of religious traditions and what have you. Because you know, so like throughout religious history, there have been civil wars. People have died by their tens of thousands uh, defending or fighting for one religious interpretation vis-a-vis -vis another religious interpretation. And the, I think the problematic in terms of both secular feminists and Islamic feminists is that when it comes to understanding what the roots of women's oppression are, when it comes to giving some kind of explanation as to why it is that we can live in a world where there have been historically different types of practices, both in terms of family um, networks, both in terms of marriage patterns, relationship patterns, etc., etc., it actually is not religious creed, it is not religious religious ideas and texts that help us to explain that. What helps us to explain that is actually examining the fundamental basis, the fundamental sort of social relationships that exist within society, what kind of um, sort of the intersections, if you like, of political economy with political authority, with the kinds of social values that exist in that society and the social values that it gives rise to, you can only understand how women's lives have been shaped and changed and transformed and what kinds of uh, systems and values they're subjected to through beginning that way round, not by beginning with religious texts, because if you begin with religious texts, you're really putting uh, the cart before the horse, um, I would say. You know, so like you're not actually making any sense of it. And of course, if you begin by saying that the answer lies in some kind of religious text, well, then you believe that the liberation lies in some kind of religious text. And believe you, me, me, for every so-called liberationist who says that the liberation for women is to rip their veils off, uh, claiming to be a Muslim, there will also be those that will say, no, the true path to women's liberation is for women to wear a veil and cover themselves up. Now, you know, for me, I don't care whether a woman wears a veil or she doesn't wear a veil. The most important thing is, is that I want to give women the choice. And the only way you're going to give women the choice, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, is to completely and utterly tear down the system and tear it down in terms of where it really matters, in terms of the roots of that system and the dynamics of that system, which lie very much in a man, man-made, a human-made system, um, not something which, you know, sort of like is, is created by something which doesn't exist in any shape or form.
Tala. That was uh, fantastic. I just learnt so much that I didn't know. Um, I just want to talk about Dewsbury in West Yorkshire because for more years than I can remember, we have been combating the attempts of the fascists to build in Dewsbury. Uh, lots of historical reasons for it. And basically what happens is the fascists announce a march in the town. We then announce a multicultural rally in the town centre and to say this, this is our town, this is our streets, there's no place for fascists. Um, we then start to build it and we go around community groups, we go to trade unions and we go to the mosques. And then the next thing that happens is the police go around the mosques and say, right, tell everyone to stay indoors, there's going to be trouble in Jews break, keep people out, it's not safe. Now, in the past, to some extent, that has worked. And over the years, there have been very few Islamic women turning up for the rallies. But I've seen quite a change recently. And we've had women coming to these. We had, we had uh, another in January, sadly, because Britain first marched. Um, and we, we've had women coming saying, this is our town. What right of the police to tell us that we can't come into our own town, but they let fascists in? Um, and uh, the last one, not only did we get a lot more people from a wide range of organisations, we had Paula Sharif, the local Labour MP, and we also had a message of support from Joe Cox, uh, because Dewsbury is part of, West York, of, of North Kirtlees, where Joe Cox um, sadly was murdered recently. Um, and what happened in January was not only did Islamic women turn, turn up, but it was actually chaired by an Islamic women. Yeah, they were taking a lead role in, in, in that rally, and it was absolutely fantastic. When the fascists did turn up, they joined in the chanting, you know, Nazi scum off our streets. Um, and, I mean, sadly, particularly, I think, in, in, in the aftermath of Joe Cox's murder, the fascists will try and organise again. Um, but we need to be back in the mosque, back in the communities, um, and we need to be going to the uh, women's meetings in the mosques and talking to the women there. And I'm quite confident, you know, that we'll, we'll be able to build and, and get a really big rally next time. And let's hope, you know, we can sort of really knock the fascists back into the sewer that they belong. After the next speaker, will be you? Eileen O'Reilly, Sheffield SWP. Um, I went to the the talk about the, the effects on, on labor relations of the immigration um, in the 60s. And it was so inspiring because there were all these pictures of, of Asian women on the front of the picket lines and fighting the police. So I suppose what I want to say is that um, you don't get liberation, you get liberation by, by action, and not by theory. And I can see that. But I still have problems, and, and I think the problem is to say anything critical, you have to be very careful where you're saying it about, about this religion. I mean, I dislike one. I, I, I feel all monotheistic religions are reactionary and oppressive. And, but I understand, because I was brought up a second generation immigrant in a Catholic community in Salford, how people cling to their identity through all things, including religion. So, what women wear is entirely up to them. One would like to think it is, anyway. Um, but to, to change is, is about <coughs> taking part in struggle. Nevertheless, I don't like... How can I put this? I think... Religions... Um, always excuse their oppression. I mean, the Catholic Church is now saying, oh, you know, the Inquisition, we burnt people alive because they were Jews or, or um, heretics or, or whatever. Well, that was just a mistake. That wasn't the real church. No, it was. It's always what they do. And Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. Frankly, the fruit's pretty rotten in, in all monotheistic religions. That's my opinion. I have a particular... I'd better tell you my particular ass, because I, uh, 33 years ago, adopted a baby. Um, uh, she was from an Islamic background, she was Somali, 
and illegitimate, which is why she was available. And over the years, I uh, had quite a lot of um, knockbacks from people on the left and, and fellow social workers who were Muslim. She's losing her heritage. She's lost her identity. She's like, um, what's that horrible phrase, a Mars bar? Or something like that? No, a bouncy bar, that's it. And the fact is, my answer to that was, yes, uh, she's lost it. Her half-sisters who went back to Somalia have lost their genitals, part of their genitals, so weigh it up. And I know that the practice of genital mutilation was a tribal one that... Comrade, that, can you please finish? Said, but it, but the, what I'm saying is, Islam didn't, didn't try to improve that or anything. You've got to see what they're actually doing right now in the world. And yes, I, I work with, um, you know, I'm, I'm outside the mosque and I leaflet and we go to the same meetings and um, demos. Nevertheless, I, I don't want to give a pass to, to Islam any more than I would to Christianity. I just want to say something about our university in Frankfurt, in Germany. The student representative for women's rights is a, a Muslim woman with, wearing the scarf, and she's very active politically. Uh, so it shows that things can change, and she's, uh, very, uh, she's getting a lot of support from the student union. Uh, her thesis is going to be on gender themes. Um, one job she has, she's confronting uh, not only she, but the whole student union, is this new pickup artist. I don't know if you know what a pickup artist is. Uh, some man, young man, who tells other, uh, does seminars telling other uh, young men how they can pick up women. You know, it's uh, t terribly um, misogyn. Um, I, I hope she's thinking of joining our new organization, Stand Up to Racism. That would be wonderful if she does. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it. Uh, and she organized, together with the student union and together with another young woman wearing the scarf, uh, a very big meeting just a few weeks ago with 200 people attending on the same theme that you, you just gave, women and Islam. And this went down very well. So it shows that, you know, we have people on our side. We can fight together. Yeah. After the next speaker will be Anne Alexander. Now, the most important thing I learned from your speech is uh, that religion is created by society. It's not the other way around, that uh, religion sort of makes up society and it changes with society. So this uh, gives us the key, really, how to uh, come to a society where uh, uh, religion does not play a repressive role anymore. I think it's fighting for a different society. It's not a special fight against this or that religion, which is a key, really, to liberation. So, uh, but I want to say something about, I come from Frankfurt in Germany. I want to say something about uh, uh, this, the importance of this debate. Um, you know about the Cologne incidents in, uh, in Sylvester, at Sylvester night, where uh, hundreds of uh, mainly North African young men uh, grabbed at uh, uh, women and robbed s some of them. And uh, it was a big, uh, a big uh, debate going on since then. And uh, one, uh, two things happened. The next uh, couple of days later, some women groups of Cologne organized a demonstration on the same place in front of the Cologne Dome uh, uh, saying for women's liberation against racism. Don't use this uh, for racist reasons. And I think it was such an important uh, demonstration. It gave many leftists hope in the whole of Germany that we can stand up against racist uh, misabuse of this, uh, these incidents. So this was very important. But you had also the other um, uh, reaction. This was the, uh, the new racist, uh, semi, as I call it, semi-fascist party, Alternative für Deutschland. They used it, and their, uh, their vote went up uh, by about 5% in, in the next few weeks. So in the elections in March, they got between 
uh, in several lender, lender elections, they got between uh, 15 and 25 percent. This is horrible, but it was partly due to these incidents. And therefore, this whole debate about Islam is terribly important uh, for the left uh, and for the anti-racist movement generally. Uh, and therefore, uh, I want to say now give you one example of uh, uh, how women liberation uh, failed to address the question of race. And this is uh, um, Alice Schwarzer. Alice Schwarzer is the main uh, speaker of the women's uh, liberation movement of, this, of se the 70s. Uh, she has a paper called Emma with an, I think, an addition of uh, 70,000 even now. And she, um, uh, uh, she uh, came out uh, in favor of Pegida. Uh, you, you have the, the uh, you have here the posters here uh, against Pegida. Uh, and uh, uh, her, uh, she says, Islam is the problem. Uh, we have to, uh, there's nothing racist about the Alternative for Deutschland, and her name has been on the homepage of Pegida for weeks and weeks, and what, what she said. And she didn't uh, dis put a distance between her and, and this. So this, she, gives, she gives the arguments now to the racist movement. This is why, why I think this is terribly important, how we address this. And Alexander will be followed by Tom Kay. Thanks. Um, I wanted to try and respond to some of the points that the comrade from Sheffield raised, and I'd like to thank her for coming up and sharing that with us. I think it's very important that we have, have these discussions, because I think the answer, I guess, that I would make to some of the concerns that she, she raised would be to say, as Talat, I think, explained extremely well, what we need to start from is a Marxist and a materialist understanding of religion, that there isn't one religion, there is not one Islam, there are many Islams. There are many different sets of practices, they're shaped by different, what different social class you come from, by the country you live in, by the context you live in. You know, and as the comrade rightly said, we firstly recognise in the context of a racist society that we, that we live in, in the UK, it is extremely important that we do not fall into the trap of giving sucker to racist arguments and stereotyping about Muslims or about Islam. But that doesn't mean that we equally fall into the trap of assuming there is one thing, which is the Muslim community, one set of Islamic practices or Islamic values, and compromise in any way in our resistance to oppression. Um, and that it is true that there are people who have a, a reformist kind of perspective who might be working within local authorities or coming through a kind of tradition of identity politics as practiced sort of within the structures of, the lo of local government and the state do fall into that way of essentializing Islam and other religions. And, and that's, not, that's not our approach. We have an uncompromising defense of, uh, of people against oppression wherever it comes from and see very much that people must fight for their own liberation. And this relates, of course, to our understanding of, of, of every religion. I mean, if I can give an example from my, my own family, my, my mother is uh, very active in the, in the Church of England. And, of course, if you take the question of the church in relation to um, homophobia, there is a huge amount of homophobia within, within the official institutions of the church, including within the Church of England. There are groups of people who are very hom homophobic. She celebrated the marriage of my brother to his husband, the first gay wedding in Lambeth. And she, I said, what did you tell your bishop? She said, I just told him I was going to be celebrating the marriage and I let him deal with it. So, you know, you can see the contradictions within how, how people who are of religious faith can find ways to come to a position where they oppose oppression and, and, and can practice uh, and, can, uh, and can show that in concrete ways. I'm not saying that my, I obviously have a different perspective about religion to my mother, but I think it's extremely important to understand that we can find ways to unite with people around questions of, uh, of oppression um, while we argue with them that actually in order to get rid of all oppressions, we have to have a materialist analysis and we have to have a fight for socialism that puts the working class at the center of that and makes a new world. Yeah, uh, I'm Tom Kay from the student office at the SWP. Um, I wanted to do two things, comrades. The first one is to make a quick announcement, and then the second is to make a point. Um, 
The quick announcement is that Nigel Farage has just resigned as UKIP leader. <laughs> and he, uh, he says he isn't going to change his mind this time, so uh, that's something to celebrate, right? Um, the second one, really, is, is just to make a general point, and that is that when, when David Cameron um, said that Muslim women are traditionally submissive, uh, it made two things clear. Um, the first one is that there is no depth to which the Tories will not go in order to whip up racism in our society. And the truth is that in 2015, attacks on Muslim women went up 356% in Britain. Uh, that's a horrific fact, and it's something that I think we all have to go out of Marxism willing to combat in every way possible. Um, the second thing that it made clear is that he's never been on a Palestine demonstration. Um, in 2014, when Israel was bombing Gaza, um, one, of the most one of the things that made the most profound impact on me was the way that young Muslim women in Britain uh, were involved in leading a mass movement against war, imperialism and racism, which in truth... Uh, frightened the British establishment, uh, forced David Cameron to pretend that he cared about Palestine, however, however briefly. Um, and in, you know, I think we have to be clear, right, that Muslim women are political leaders in Britain. And by that I don't mean Baroness Saeed Avasi, who despite the fact she thinks that uh, the Conservative Party is racist, is still, is still a part of it. Uh, what I mean is that up and down the country, the movement against racism, uh, the movement to do something around the refugee crisis, uh, the movement against further wars in the Middle East and so on, is led by young Muslim women. Uh, how do we know this? Well, one of the examples is the fact that Mali Abouaia has just been elected as the president of the National Union of Students. Absolutely incredible. Algerian refugee, Muslim woman, uh, elected to be the leader of the National Union of Students. We should celebrate it, uh, and in truth we should defend her uh, when the uh, racist and sexist attacks continue in September as the right-wing media turns uh, their glare uh, back, uh, back upon her. But Farage's resignation... Uh, the crisis in the Tory party, um, I think, open up great opportunities for us. Um, I've got to be honest, I'm, quite, I'm relatively young, despite the fact that I'm going bald, and this is what I'm going to sum up, really. Is I don't think there's ever been a time in our lives uh, where people on the left can have such an impact on events. Um, at Marxism, people have talked a lot about the 16th of July demonstration uh, called by the People's Assembly and Stand Up to Racism. Uh, no to racism, no more austerity, kick the Tories out. Uh, I think we have to go out of this event fighting to entrench and build the movement against racism, using that demonstration as the key, and say to Cameron, uh, to Johnson, to whoever ends up standing and winning the Tory leadership contest, we're coming for you. And we're coming for you alongside our sisters, regardless of their religion, because we are sick of a society that creates racism, that stokes wars, and so on. And if you're interested in building that movement, then uh, join us on the streets of the 16th of July, but also join the Socialist Workers' Party. Thank you. Yes, um, no, no, thank you to everyone. Um, I, I'm not going to take very long at all. I mean, I think one thing to, to say is that when we're talking about religious traditions, and obviously because we've been talking about Islam, it's understandable why people um, focus on monotheistic um, religions. Um, and yes, you know, so like Judaism, Christianity um, don't have anything particularly great to say about women in any shape or form. But I think it's also important to understand that, so like you know, in all religious creeds, questions of interpretation apply absolutely everywhere. I mean, you know, I, I study South Asia in terms of my job. Hinduism. Um, there's a book, a, a, a religious textbook, it's called The Laws of Manu. Um, which talks about a woman not only being half a man, but the woman being a quarter of a man. Inside very, very, very strict conservative Hindu practices to this day inside of, inside of India and elsewhere. Um, it sanctions, and it has done historically, child marriage. It sanctions the practice of sati, you know, widow self-immolation, etc., etc. Uh, even today, inside of India, you have a resurgence of a very, very deeply conservative, very right-wing strand of uh, Hindu fanaticism, um, which isn't just anti-Muslim, I mean, there's that um, aspect to it, but it's also deeply misogynist um, about, about women um, in terms of um, 
in terms of what women, women can be like. In small villages, it still sanctions the idea of a woman as young, you know, a girl as young as eight years old being married to an old man. And of course, she's likely to become a widow. And in that scenario, she is forbidden to marry anybody else, to take any other spouse. She has to go. And in these tiny little villages, she has to go and live in some colony, which are just specifically for widows and to shave her hair and everything else. So when we're talking about, you know, this really, really awful, um, aspects of women's oppression. It is something that exists not just across different kinds of religious traditions, but the question that that surely should be raising in everybody's head is that, that therefore it can't just be the religion that's doing that. There's got to be something else if you're seeing this uniformly in different types of, uh, in different types of societies. Um, which brings me on to the question of, um, of um, female genital mutilation. I mean, you know, so like the very first speaker who brought it up. Um, and yes, you know, you were absolutely right that, um, it, it, that this is a practice which isn't just to do with Islam. You said that sort of like, you know, it's a tribal practice, but you also said it's a practice that you don't see Islam as doing anything against. Now, I think, again, we've got to be really careful because, you know, what is the evidence, what are the sources that we're examining here? My parents come from India, all right? The idea that in um, Muslim communities in South Asia, um, either female infanticide or female genital mutilation was ever going to be used, um, you know, but, but, but it was a complete non, non-starter. That was not something that is a dominant practice inside of um, Islam and the subcontinent any more than Muslim men taking up to four wives. I mean, it's like if, if my father had ever dared suggest that he was going to take three extra wives to my mother, not only would she have walked out on him, her entire family and his family would have been in uproar. In other words, what this is pointing to is that you have to look at the specifics of the society, the specific of the characteristics of a different of, of different societies you know so like what are the specific norms and these norms don't stand independently of wider structures within that society in order to get to grips with and attempt to understand what are the roots that govern different types of patterns of behavior for both men and women in terms of in terms of how people live their lives and therefore to try and understand what are the specific things that are contributing in different societies to increase levels of of Mr. John, Mr. Of, um, of, uh, of oppressive attitudes towards women, and I think it's, it's it, it, you know the reason I want to sort of emphasise this is because not only is it true to say that you know in different parts of the world you've had um, genital female um, mutilation done within Christian communities. Yes, you have. And if you're going to say, throw the question of Islam isn't doing anything to stop this, well, why is that question not being posed of Christianity in different parts of the world? You know, why is it not being posed of other types of traditions in different parts of the world? And this brings me really back to the question of... Um, of feminist narratives around this and secularism. You know, you know, we in the SWP, we are Marxists, we are historical materialists, uh, I'm an atheist, um, but you know what? Our atheism is not challenged by the fact that people hold religious ideas in this society. We understand why people look towards religion. And not only do we understand that, but in, under, you know, sort of like in locating why it is within the most obscene levels of inequality and oppression and violence and racism, and you know, sort of like even in the modern era, attempts at trying to reassert imperialism in different parts of the world, we can understand why people who are oppressed in different parts of the globe can end up looking to all sorts of signifiers of their culture and religion is just one aspect of it. We can understand why they look to that in terms of identity. In terms of us understanding that does not mean that we in any shape or form buy into being completely uncritical about all sorts of questions and aspects. We certainly don't. But I suppose the final thing I just want to say is that you know, when it comes to Muslim women, it's like women anywhere, right? 
women are going to be the authors of their own destiny. Now, you know, it ain't going to be a man, it ain't going to be their husband, it ain't going to be their father, it ain't going to be their brother, etc. You know, throughout the whole history um, of humanity, and particularly when we think about the history of capitalism, and even sort of, you know, predating capitalism, it isn't the case that you have an absence of women being involved in history. I mean, you know, one of the, the things that's really, really quite critical about capitalism as a class society Society, which makes it very different to, um, to pre-capitalist class societies, is that not only do you have a scenario where you have vast numbers of women alongside their men who are actually you know, exploited, um, to, you know, to, to, use, to use the proper terminology about it, in terms of the kind of world that we live in where people have to sell their labor power, whether they like it or not, they have to go out to work. But also, it means that we live in a society where there is the capacity for women to actually come together, for women to group together on all sorts of issues. And, you know, when people talk about the women that have been involved as activists over Palestine demonstrations, that is absolutely true. Um, but, you know, one of the first speakers earlier on also talked about um, the history of immigration and the fight against immigration. And you talked about uh, the, the photos that you've seen of Asian women being very, very militant. And, you know, because the, the critical thing here is about both class and it is about fighting back against oppression and seeing that that oppression is completely and utterly linked to wider questions of class within our society. Someone brought up, um, you know, Sadia Varsi um, and, um, you know, how she's still inside the Tory party. I mean, you know, she, she certainly is not a submissive Muslim woman. I mean, you know, you'd have thought that Cameron could have understood that. Um, and, you know, and it's very great that she's turned around and uh, been critical of Cameron and the Tory party over questions of Islamophobia. That's absolutely brilliant. But, of course, she's not going to break with the Tory party. She isn't going to go out and demonstrate against the Tory party because her other more wider interests are very much in favour of supporting and defending the society that sadly spews out Islamophobia. So although she can be very critical of certain aspects of Islamophobia and racism, she will not lead a fight to absolutely end that system. And that's because her class position, her class interests are dictating in a very, very different direction to the interests of young activists that have gone on demonstrations um, in support of Palestine or young Asian work, women workers that have been involved in demonstrations, in strikes against immigration controls or in strikes as many as, you know, we will have a teacher's strike in tomorrow. Yes, there's a teacher strike tomorrow. You know, not only are you going to see vast numbers of women workers out on the strike, you're going to see an awful lot of Asian women workers out uh, on that strike, and many of them are going to be from a Muslim background. You know, the point is, is that women can be authors of their own destiny in conjunction with working class men. That's what I want to see. And you know, when it comes to um, <laughs> when people talk about the idea that somehow Muslim women need liberating, I mean, even actually phrasing it in that format, you know, just think about it, is so utterly patronizing and backward. No woman needs liberating. Women will liberate themselves, but they will do that in conjunction with men on their side to once and for all try to put an end to a system which either uses religious ideas or other types of ideas to try and justify and legitimize our oppression. We will fight back together to try to destroy that once and for all.